Okay, so firstly, I just want to say thank you very much to Liana, Marianne, and Lorna for organizing the session and for inviting me to contribute. I am from the University of Exeter, but I spent the last 20 years working in Ireland, so my, uh, my data is mostly Irish. So I'm going to be telling you about two case studies from medieval Gaelic Ireland. And both of these individuals have collection deformities, but both of them would have required different types of care. So we're applying the approach developed by Lorna Tilly, the Bioarchaeology of Care approach, just to look at the care, the treatment, or the accommodation um, which uh, these individuals may have received. So just some background, um, Ireland is on the top corner of the map, and the site that we're looking at is Valley Shannon, which is in South County Donegal, which is in Northwest Ireland. So it was originally excavated in 2003. I was one of the original excavators of the site. Um, it was part of a road scheme, and they unexpectedly found uh, the remains of a medieval church, and then 1,300 burials surrounding the church. Um, so it was excavated over a uh, six-month period. We have about 95 radiocarbon dates from the site, and the radiocarbon dates that we have are predominantly later medieval in date. So the site itself dates from the 7th century through to the 17th century, but 85% of the radiocarbon dates fall between the 12th and 17th century, so we're mostly looking at later medieval period. So the individuals who were buried in this small kind of chapel were likely the tenant farmers and labourers um, of Gaelic Ireland. So we're likely looking at those who were working the land. It's a pastoral and an arable um, economy. And so when we look at the animal bones that were found, it was mostly cattle, sheep, goats, pigs. But predominantly cattle were the main um, animals that they were working with. So the diets of the people would have included oats and milk, supplemented with um, vegetables, fruits, salted meats, uh, seaweed, fresh water fish, such as eels, etc. So we have no evidence of the settlement. There were no uh, houses that were excavated in the close proximity, but we do have some cartographic evidence which shows us what the medieval houses of this period looked like. So we're looking at a rural dispersed population or settlement they're mostly living in um, these kind of uh, simple dwellings uh, without chimneys. Um, and most of the individuals who are buried in the graveyard, it's a Christian graveyard, so they're mostly buried uh, with a West East orientation. There's uh, very little evidence, in fact, no evidence of coffins, so we think for the most part they're just um, wrapped in shrouds, stripped, wrapped in shrouds, and then placed into earthen graves when they're buried. So the first of the two individuals is uh, SK606, which is a middle-aged male who is between approximately 30 to 40 years of age at time of death. So this individual is slightly taller than the average male. The skeleton was largely complete and they had good bone preservation. The individual is buried in a north-south orientation that we can see on the map, on the photograph. Um, and this was an atypical orientation. So for the most part, as I said, the, in, the people in the, the graveyard had been buried uh, with their heads to the west, but there were some kind of atypical orientations, and some but not all of these individuals had either obvious physical impairments or uh, very poor health, um, tuberculosis, etc. But that wasn't uh, consistently the case. So there's a possible pattern there, but it's not, not consistently the case. So this individual had a well-healed medial clavicle fracture, a uh, fracture of the ribs that was healing at the time of death, so that's significant because we know that the injury occurred shortly before death. And the main lesion that I'm interested in was a central fracture dislocation at the left hip joint. So you might notice also that the clavicle fracture and the rib fracture are both on the same side on the left hand side. So it's possible that they were sustained um, as a result of instability uh, once this individual and was moving again. So this is a central fracture dislocation of the hip. The femoral head has burst through the obturator foramen. It's moved medially and anteriorly. And we can see that there is significant spherical new bone formation around the, the head of the femoral head. This resulted in permanent flexion deformity. So the individual was left with their leg at a 90 degree angle from their pelvis. 
uh, during life. So this is obviously creating a, quite an apparent physical abnormality. The muscle markings on the upper limbs weren't particularly pronounced, and there wasn't much evidence of stress in the spine. There also wasn't any evidence of degenerative joint disease on the unaffected right leg. So it's possible that the male was largely mobile following the injury. So if we just think through then the clinical impacts of this. So obviously this is a really significant injury and even in modern populations it can be um, uh, quite difficult to treat and um, can cause uh, really um, fatal uh, secondary complications. So in the short term we can say that initially he would have been in pain, shock, probably suffered nausea, weakness, dizziness. The possible secondary complications, now some of these are uh, likely to have been fatal had he sustained them. So although these are known secondary complications, they're perhaps less likely. So severe hypovolemic shock, a bladder rupture or bladder wall entrapment or pelvic hemorrhage. And out of those, the one that's most likely is the bladder wall entrapment, which would have caused urine to leak um, uh, following that injury. In the medium term, he obviously had reduced uh, mobility, inability to use the lower limb, uh, loss of the joint movement, and um, likely, because this individual is probably immobile for maybe two to three months while the um, hip was healing, uh, we can say that he probably had a depressed immune system during this time, gastrointestinal dysfunction, respiratory tract, dis respiratory tract dysfunction, uh, urinary tract dysfunction, um, cardiovascular dysfunction, and potentially also pressure sores. It would have been quite possible that this individual would have become uh, very poorly, very quickly, following such a significant injury. So alongside these, uh, he possibly also had pain, psychological depression, and potentially neurological dysfunction as well, depending upon nerve entrapment. So in the longer term then, the individual had, um, it was left with an abnormal posture and likely um, osteopenia as well. So during the time that this individual would have been bedridden, so we're thinking of a period of two to three months, he would have required help for definitely um, following activities of daily living. So it's likely that he was able to eat and drink independently, but the food would have had to be provided to him, and he would have had to have been moved into a position that enabled him to eat and drink. Um, he may have required help with personal hygiene. He could potentially have um, uh, used his hands for a small object manipulation, but would have required help with um, mobility, so short distances, uh, or moving around a limited area, and would have required help to change posture as well. So, in the immediate aftermath of the injury then, he would have required quite intensive nursing. So, providing adequate fluid and nutrition, potentially a special diet, perhaps with increased protein to aid uh, the bone healing, um, would have required help with toileting, bathing, uh, keeping pressure sores clean, help with movement, changing position, massage, regulating the body temperature, um, close monitoring for infections, and psychological support. In the longer term, he potentially used walking aids, so walking sticks or crutches, for really short distance um, stability and movement. Uh, I think it's unlikely that he was uh, using these for longer distances because there's very little evidence of stress elsewhere in the skeleton, but we do see those fractures on the same side, so it's likely instability could have caused um, falls as well. He would have required accommodation to allow participation in social and cultural activities, and before he died, he would have required additional palliative care because there was evidence of infection, the systemic infection evident in his system. So in the longer term, he would have required additional help from the family and the community. Um, he wouldn't have been able to undertake the tasks that were normal for males in his community. 
Um, so tending and herding uh, animals, um, riding large animals, growing and milling crops, um, growing, maintaining buildings, thatching, carpentry, procurement of peat, wood, etc. So it's quite clear that in this case, accommodation was required. In this individual, he went from being a fully active, um, or he likely went from being a fully active member of the community to suddenly having a very traumatic injury, which then altered um, what he was able to do. So it's likely that he also potentially suffered from depression, anxiety, um, and was potentially angry, angry or frustrated about the change in self-image as well. And of course, this would have also had some impact on um, his sexual kind of health and well-being as well. So it's not possible to know who is responsible for the care of this individual, but it's likely that care was undertaken with the support of family members and neighbours. So we're going to whiz through the second case study, because I'm running out of time. And so this is a middle-aged male between about 35 to 50 years of age at time of death. And you can see that the skeleton is quite complete. But the lesion that I want to talk about in particular is in the knee joint. So this individual has either septic arthritis or perhaps tuberculous arthritis evident at the left knee joint. It's caused a posterior dislocation. We can see that there's an ankylosis of all the bony elements. Um, it's likely that the level of uh, new bone formation makes us more likely to be secondary to an infection rather than a traumatic injury alone. So, in the short term, he would have suffered stiffness, redness, joint pain and swelling. Um, in the medium term, potentially compromised immune system, particularly if there's an infection um, uh, evident in the system. And then in the long term, uh, postural instability. But for this individual, he would have been able to undertake all of the essential activities of daily living. So it's more likely that the care that was provided was accommodation by his community. So um, we are also looking at the humeral head, which uh, had a probable anatomical split uh, fracture. So uh, anatomical neck um, fracture. So for this individual, we can imagine that he can undertake the essential activities of daily living, but Things that he might have been able to do, such as um, localised craft activities, he may have had additional uh, trouble with, given his right shoulder, um, and particularly if he's right-handed. So we can see that there may have been some kind of uh, accommodation by the community um, as to the tasks that he could undertake. In terms of just thinking more broadly about care in the medieval period in Ireland, at this point we have healers, bone setters, um, wise women, um, there's a magical religious culture surrounding care and health care as well. Um, and part of this involves um, visiting of holy wells and holy trees. And people would come to holy wells and drink the water and believe that that um, contributed to their care um, and health and well-being. So there's eight of these wells in the local vicinity and this is the closest one to the site. So it's like that these were also visited. So just to conclude then, within this population, there was 869 adults, and there was a huge array of really interesting pathologies. Lots of the people would have required health, health care at some point across their lifespan. Of course, when we're adopting the bioarchaeology of care approach, we're looking at the conservative approach. And so the model of care was likely um, far more intensive than the kind of bare, bare uh, model that I've laid out for you. It's likely that um, care was undertaken by family and neighbours. Um, we can envisage too that perhaps children and elderly may have had an active role in that care as well. And that this care was um, supported by uh, the apothecaries and the monasteries, um, by healers, bone setters, herbalists, etc. Um, and part of the care may have also included these magical religious practices which were particularly prevalent in Ireland. I think I'll stop there. And um, just my acknowledgement, so the National Roads Authority funded the research and then thanks to the wider team as well.